This is Monardo citriodata. It is a wildflower native to many areas in the southern United States and northern Mexico, and you may recognize the flower by some of its common names like bee balm, horse mint, or lemon bee balm. It is an annual plant in the family Lamiaceae, which is also known as the mint family, and it presents characteristics like a square stem, floral bracts, and serrated opposite leaves. Additionally, it got its nickname lemon bee balm from its leaves smelling citrusy or lemon scented. Bee balm can have white, pink, or lavender flowers with purple dots that are monoecious. And monoecious just means that they contain both male and female parts. The flower structure is also tubular and bilaterally symmetric, and the flowers present themselves at various heights as crowded clusters just above the bracts. If one were to look for these wildflowers, one should look in the months of May, June, July, and August, and potentially even September and October, dependent on the amount of rain that the flower has received during the warmer months. Also, one should look in grassland habitats like prairies and savannas with higher clay content. For example, I found this large patch of lemon bee balm that you're seeing here in a vertisol soil, which is the dominant soil type in the native range on the Texas Blackland Prairie. And if I haven't bored you away from this video just yet, we're actually going to move from looking at this flower in its native habitat and actually try to take a closer look at the wildflower and look at some of the finer structures that it forms and recognize just how beautiful this organism is while discussing some of its adaptations through an evolutionary lens. And hopefully we'll get to view some of its inhabitants and wonder what ecological purpose they may serve for the flower and for the ecosystem as a whole. Now one of the first places we are going to look at is at the very top of the plant. Here we get to see an up close look at two flowers that have recently developed, and you may notice that the flowers have bilateral symmetry and a tubular structure. Now for those of you that don't know what bilateral symmetry means in the context of talking about flowers, just imagine that we were to take a vertical line and cut this flower in two. And now the two parts that we have would be perfect mirror images of each other. We can also visualize some of the early stages of how bee balm produces a dense habitat for microfauna through the use of its clusters of flowers, bracts, and spinose bristles. Habitat that can attract both good and bad organisms. Now as we begin to move lower on the plant and look at some of the more mature flowers that have developed, one of the first things I would really like to point out are the small shimmering dots on top of the petals. These small dots are one of my favorite parts of the flower, and through doing some reading online, I couldn't find any direct research that has looked at why bee balm may use vital resources to produce these pearlescent dots. We could speculate that these dots may catch the eye of pollinators passing by, and there has been some research looking at how flowers from different species increase various optical phenomena by producing angle-dependent coloration through microstructures. And I know angle-dependent coloration sounds fancy, but it basically just means that it's producing visual effects like iridescence or mirror-like reflectance, kind of like what you're seeing on the petal right now. And many scientists do believe that these structures are a visual signal to potential pollinators, but it currently remains unresolved as to whether such optical effects are even biologically significant when considering the sensory capabilities of some of our important pollinators like bees. And although scientists are still studying these microstructures, there are other mechanisms that plants use to attract pollinators to their flowers. One well-studied adaptation related to this theory is that plants produce a sort of landing strip at the opening of their flowers that tell pollinators exactly where to go. Now with lemon bee balm, it is an obvious contrast in colors, and we can see that the purple dots help guide a pollinator into the opening of the flower. And although we can see these patterns on the lemon bee balm flowers, some plants have evolved to produce these signals in a UV spectra because bees view light in this wavelength. And if this interests you, I highly recommend that you take a look at Craig P. Burroughs' photography. He takes photos of flowers under UV spectra to kind of help us better understand what our pollinators may be seeing, and he even has one of lemon bee balm right here. Now we are going to take a look inside of the flower and talk about an overlooked structure that serves a huge ecological role for flower and pollinator relationships. These small bristle-like arrangements at the mouth of the flower are broadly called nectar guide trichomes. And funny enough, many bumblebee pollinated flowers, especially those that are bilaterally symmetric, like bee balm, 
have evolved to have these trichomes so that pollinators can use them as footholds while foraging for the nectar inside. It's kind of fascinating to imagine that plants with a small floral structure and a relatively large pollinator species like a bumblebee would go through such efforts to evolve tiny footholds to help them hang on while foraging. And although we've discussed a few of the floral parts, they are all nothing without the other, and these pieces all combine into one function, which is to attract a pollinator and make sure it somehow interacts with the reproductive organs, which on this flower are located at the top of the flower opening. And earlier in the video, I mentioned that these flowers are monoecious. And again, all that means is that one flower has both male and female reproductive parts. Given this, we are now going to take a closer look at each part, starting with the male structure. Currently, what we are zooming in on is something called the anthers, which is one of two parts that makes up the stamen, which is the entire male anatomy. The anthers produce pollen, which are the small bead-like shapes you can see within the anther capsule, and as bees navigate these flowers, the pollen will then get trapped to their hairs through electrostatic forces and will then get carried to another flower where it hopefully gets stuck to something called the stigma. The stigma is one of many parts of the female anatomy and has a sticky surface that helps entrap the pollen granules, kind of like what you're looking at here. And once this interaction occurs, the flower will then proceed to form a pollen tube down the style to the ovary where fertilization will happen. Our enjoyment of these flowers is then cut short as it has now served its purpose for the entire organism. And soon the petals will wilt away as the seeds are formed inside of the ovules and the flowering season altogether will come to an end. And although my favorite time of year is ending, I am thankful that the processes that we have discussed will form many seeds and new plants for our enjoyment next year. Before I go today, I figured we could take a break from discussing flowers and look at some of the microfauna that you may have noticed hiding behind the scenes. Now I am no entomologist, but I did have fun watching these insects go about their day-to-day -day activities, and after I noticed the diversity of insects wandering around, I felt like you could spend an entire lifetime just studying the micro-ecosystem of a single flower. And we aren't going to stop and discuss every insect that you've seen on screen, but I thought it would be fun to observe what I believe to be a juvenile aphid, learning to traverse the vast landscape of this flower and forage for resources. Aphids are common soft-bodied insects that use elongated mouthparts to pierce and suck nutrients from plants. Some plants can be very sensitive to the saliva injected by these bugs, as it can carry many viruses that will harm and could even kill the host species. Fatal damage is usually only done in large groups, and the single aphid we are observing today seems that it isn't causing too much trouble for our bee ball. This aphid is currently attempting to feed on something called a bract. Bracts are modified leaves, and lemon bee balm creates very extravagant aromatic bracts to attract pollinators to its flowers. But rather than luring in a bee, this bract has unfortunately attracted a hungry aphid, and we can now see that the juvenile aphid has clumsily found an acceptable spot as it plants its feet and proceeds to use its mouth to extract resources from the bract. And despite its small size, the aphid plays a significant role in the ecosystem. As the plant acquires inorganic nutrients from the soil, the aphid is one of the first organisms to derive organic nutrients from the plant, and carry these nutrients further into the food web for other organisms, thus developing the overall flow of the nutrient cycle. I'm happy that we can observe its interactions with the plant at such a small scale, and hopefully this aphid doesn't cause too much damage to other plants as it grows. But just as all organisms need to eat, so does this little guy. It's easy to fall into the lens of the microscope and forget how small the things we observe today truly are. It's a good reminder that the world we live in is extremely complex and there's so much for us to learn and discover. And when we study details, such as the intricate structures of the flowers or these insect micro-ecosystems, we can gain insights into how intriguing these biological systems actually are. And I hope that when you walk down the sidewalk and see a wildflower, you can remember what we observed today and imagine the complex system that may be at hand. I want to thank you so much for watching this video, and please comment down below if you know any of the insects we saw today or have any questions and I would be happy to answer. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to see more, and I hope you have a great day.